of all the young gallants in scotland in the thirteenth century there was none more gracious and debonair than thomas learmont laird of the castle of erkildoon in berwickshire he loved books poetry and music which were uncommon tastes in those days and above all he loved to study nature and to watch the habits of the beasts and birds that made their abode in the fields and woods round about his home now it chanced that one sunny may morning thomas left his tower of erkildoon and went wandering into the woods that lay about the Huntley Burn, a little stream that came rushing down from the slopes of the Eildon Hills. It was a lovely morning, fresh and bright and warm, and everything was so beautiful that it looked as paradise might look. The tender leaves were bursting out of their sheaths, and covering all the trees with a fresh, soft mantle of green, and amongst the carpet of moss under the young man's feet, yellow primroses and starry anemones were turning up their faces to the morning sky. The little birds were singing like to burst their throats, and hundreds of insects were flying backwards and forwards in the sunshine, while down by the burnside the bright-eyed water-rats were poking their noses out of their holes, as if they knew that summer had come and wanted to have a share in all that was going on. Thomas felt so happy with the gladness of it all that he threw himself down at the root of a tree to watch the living things around him. As he was lying there, he heard the trampling of a horse's hoofs as it forced its way through the bushes, and looking up, he saw the most beautiful lady that he had ever seen coming riding towards him on a grey palfrey. She wore a hunting dress of glistening silk, the colour of the fresh spring grass, and from her shoulders hung a velvet mantle which matched the riding skirt exactly. Her yellow hair, like rippling gold, hung loosely round her shoulders, and on her head sparkled a diadem of precious stones, which flashed like fire in the sunlight. Her saddle was of pure ivory, and her saddle-cloth of blood-red satin, while her saddle-girths were of corded silk and her stirrups of cut crystal. Her horse's reins were of beaten gold, all hung with little silver bells, so that as she rode along she made a sound like music. Apparently she was bent on the chase, for she carried a hunting horn and a sheaf of arrows, and she led seven greyhounds along in a leash, while as many scenting hounds ran loose at her horse's side. As she rode down the glen she lilted a bit of an old Scottish song, and she carried herself with such a royal air, and her dress was so magnificent, that Thomas knelt by the side of the path, for he thought it must be the Queen herself. But when the rider came to where he was and understood his thoughts, she laughed. "'I am not that lady as thou thinkest,' she said. "'Men call me queen, but it is of a far other country, for I am the queen of fairyland.' And certainly it seemed as if what she said were true, for from that moment it was as if a spell were cast over Thomas, making him forget prudence and caution and common sense itself, for he knew that it was dangerous for mortals to meddle with fairies. Yet he was so entranced with the lady's beauty that he begged her to give him a kiss. This was just what she wanted, for she knew that if she once kissed him, she had him in her power. And to the young man's horror, as soon as their lips had met, an awful change came over her, for her beautiful mantle and riding skirt of silk seemed to fade away, leaving her clad in a long grey garment, which was just the colour of ashes. Her beauty seemed to fade away also, and she grew old and wan, and worst of all, half of her abundant yellow hair went grey before his very eyes. She saw the poor man's astonishment and terror, and she burst into a mocking laugh. "'I am not so fair to look on now as I was at first, she said. "'But that matters little, for thou hast sold thyself, Thomas, to be my servant for seven long years. For whoso kisseth the fairy queen must e'en go with her to fairyland, and serve her there till that time is past.' When he heard those words, poor Thomas fell on his knees and begged for mercy. But mercy he could not obtain. The elfin queen only laughed in his face, and brought her dapple-grey palfrey close up to where he was kneeling. "'No, no,' she said, in answer to his entreaties. "'Thou didst ask the kiss, and now thou must pay the price. So dally no longer, but mount behind me, for it is full time that I was gone.' So Thomas, with many a sigh and groan of terror, mounted behind her, 
and as soon as he had done so, she shook her bridle rein, and the grey steed galloped off. On and on they went, going swifter than the wind, till they left the land of the living behind, and came to the edge of a great desert, which stretched before them, dry and bare and desolate, to the edge of the far horizon. At least so it seemed to the weary eyes of Thomas of Erkildun, and he wondered if he and his strange companion had to cross this desert, and if so, if there were any chance of reaching the other side of it alive. But the fairy queen suddenly tightened her rein, and the grey palfrey stopped short in its wild career. "'Now must thou descend to earth, Thomas,' said the lady, glancing over her shoulder at her unhappy captive. "'And kneel down and lay thy head on my knee, and I will show thee hidden things which cannot be seen by mortal eyes.' So Thomas dismounted and louted down, and rested his head on the fairy queen's knee, and lo, as he looked once more over the desert, everything seemed changed for he saw a road leading across it now, which he had not noticed before. It was a bonny, bonny road, winding up a hillside among brackens and heather and golden-yellow winds, and it looked as if it would be a pleasant travelling to pass that way. Now, said the fairy queen, the bonny road that runs up the brae among the fens, and leadeth no mortal kens whither, but I ken where it leadeth, Thomas, for it leadeth unto fair elf-land, and that road take we. And mark ye, Thomas, if ever thou hopest to see thine own tower of Erkildoon again, take care of thy tongue when we reach our journey's end, and speak no single word to any one save me. For the mortal who openeth his lips rashly in fairyland must bide there for ever. Then she bade him mount her palfrey again, and they rode on. The ferny road was not so bonny all the way as it had been at first, however, for they had not ridden along it very far before it led them into a narrow ravine, which seemed to go right down under the earth, where there was no ray of light to guide them, and where the air was dank and heavy. There was a sound of rushing water everywhere, and at last the great palfrey plunged right into it, and it crept up, cold and chill, first over Thomas's feet and then over his knees. His courage had been slowly ebbing ever since he had been parted from the daylight, but now he gave himself up for lost, for it seemed to him certain that his strange companion and he would never come safe to their journey's end. He fell forward in a kind of swoon, and if it had not been that he had tight hold of the fairy's ash-gray gown, I warrant he had fallen from his seat and had been drowned. But all things, be they good or bad, pass in time, and at last the darkness began to lighten, and the light grew stronger until they were back in broad sunshine. Then Thomas took courage and looked up, and lo, they were riding through a beautiful orchard, where apples and pears, dates and figs and wine-berries grew in great abundance, and his tongue was so parched and dry and he felt so faint that he longed for some of the fruit to restore him. He stretched out his hand to pluck some of it, but his companion turned in her saddle and forbade him. "'There is nothing safe for thee to eat here,' she said, "'save an apple which I will give thee presently. If thou touch aught else, thou art bound to remain in fairyland for ever.' So poor Thomas had to restrain himself as best he could, and they rode slowly on until they came to a tiny tree all covered with red apples. The fairy queen bent down and plucked one and handed it to her companion. "'This I can give thee,' she said, "'and I do it gladly, for these apples are the apples of truth, and whoso eateth them gaineth this reward that his lips will never more be able to frame a lie.' Thomas took the apple and ate it, and forevermore the grace of truth rested on his lips, and that is why in after years men called him True Thomas.' They had only a little way to go after this, before they came in sight of a magnificent castle standing on a hillside. "'Yonder is my abode,' said the queen, pointing to it proudly. "'There dwelleth my consort and all the nobles of our court. And as my husband hath an uncertain temper, and shows no liking for any strange gallant whom he sees in my company, I pray thee to utter no word to any one who speaketh to thee for thine own sake.' and if any one should ask me who and what thou art i will tell them that thou art dumb so wilt thou pass unnoticed in the crowd with these words the lady raised her hunting-horn and blew a loud and piercing blast and as she did so a marvellous change came over her again 
for her ugly ash-covered gown dropped off her and the grey in her hair vanished and she appeared once more in her green riding skirt and mantle and her face grew young and fair and a wonderful change passed over thomas also for as he chanced to glance downwards he found that his rough country clothes had been transformed into a suit of fine brown cloth and that on his feet he wore satin shoon immediately the sound of the horn rang out and the doors of the castle flew open and the king hurried out to meet the queen accompanied by such a number of knights and ladies minstrels and page boys that thomas who had slid from his palfrey had no difficulty in obeying her wishes and passing into the castle unobserved every one seemed very glad to see the queen back again and they crowded into the great hall in her train and she spoke to them all graciously and allowed them to kiss her hand then she passed with her husband to a dais at the far end of the huge apartment, where two thrones sat on which the royal pair seated themselves to watch the revels which now began. Poor Thomas, meanwhile, stood far away at the other end of the hall, feeling very lonely yet fascinated by the extraordinary scene on which he was gazing. For although all the fine ladies and courtiers and knights were dancing in one part of the hall, there were huntsmen coming and going in another part, carrying in great antler deer and throwing them down in heaps on the floor, and there were rows of cooks standing beside the animals, cutting them up into joints and bearing away the joints to be cooked. Altogether it was such a strange, fantastic scene that Thomas took no heed of how the time flew, but stood and gazed and gazed, never speaking a word to anybody. This went on for three long days. Then the Queen rose from her throne, and stepping from the dais, crossed the hall to where he was standing. "'Tis time to mount and ride, Thomas,' she said, "'if thou wouldst ever see the fair castle of Erkildun again.' Thomas looked at her in amazement. "'Thou spokest of seven long years, lady,' he exclaimed. "'And I have been here but three days.' The Queen smiled. "'Time passeth quickly in Fairyland, my friend,' she replied. "'Thou thinkest that thou hast been here but three days. "'Tis seven years since we two met, and now it is time for thee to go.' I would fain have had thy presence with me longer, but I dare not for thine own sake. For every seventh year an evil messenger cometh from the regions of darkness, and carrieth back with him one of our followers, whomsoever he chanceth to choose. And as thou art a goodly fellow, I fear that he might choose thee. So, as I would be loth to let harm befall thee, I will take thee back to thine own country this very night. Once more the grey palfrey was brought, and Thomas and the Queen mounted it, and, as they had come, so they returned to the Isle d'Entree, near the Huntley Burn. Then the Queen bade Thomas farewell, and as a parting gift he asked her to give him something that would let people know that he had really been to Fairyland. "'I have already given thee the gift of truth,' she replied. "'I will now give thee the gifts of prophecy and poetry.' so that thou wilt be able to foretell the future and also to write wondrous verses and besides these unseen gifts here is something that mortals can see with their own eyes a harp that was fashioned in fairyland fare thee well my friend some day perchance i will return for thee again with these words the lady vanished and thomas was left alone feeling a little sorry if the truth must be told at parting with such a strange being and coming back to the ordinary haunts of men. After this he lived for many a long year in his castle of Erkildun, and the fame of his poetry and of his prophecies spread all over the country, so that people named him True Thomas and Thomas the Rhymer. I cannot write down for you all the prophecies which Thomas uttered, and which most surely came to pass, but I will tell you one or two. He foretold the battle of Bannockbourne in these words, The burn of bread shall rin for red, which came to pass on that terrible day when the waters of the little Bannockburn were reddened by the blood of the defeated English. He also foretold the union of the crowns of England and Scotland under a prince who was the son of a French queen and who yet bore the blood of Bruce in his veins. A French queen shall bear the sun, shall rule old Britain to the sea, as ne'er is the ninth degree. Which thing came true in 1603, when King James, son of Mary, Queen of Scots, became monarch of both countries. Fourteen long years went by, and people were beginning to forget that Thomas the Rhymer had ever been in Fairyland. 
but at last a day came when Scotland was at war with England, and the Scottish army was resting by the banks of the Tweed, not far from the tower of Erkildoon. And the master of the tower determined to make a feast and invite all the nobles and barons who were leading the army to sup with him. That feast was long remembered, for the laird of Erkildoon took care that everything was as magnificent as it could possibly be, and when the meal was ended he rose in his place, and taking his elfin harp he sang to his assembled guests song after song of the days of long ago. The guests listened breathlessly, for they felt that they would never hear such wonderful music again, and so it fell out. For that very night, after all the nobles had gone back to their tents, a soldier on guard saw in the moonlight a snow-white deer moving slowly down the road that ran past the camp. There was something so unusual about the animal that he called to his officer to come and look at it. And the officer called to his brother officers, and soon there was quite a crowd softly following the creature, which paced solemnly on, as if it were keeping time to music unheard by mortal ears. "'There is something uncanny about this,' said one soldier at last. "'Let us send for Laird Thomas of Erkildoon, but chance he may be able to tell us if it be an omen or no.' "'Aye, send for Thomas of Erkildoon!' cried everyone at once. So a little page was sent in haste to the old tower to rouse the rhymer from his slumbers. When he heard the boy's message, the seer's face grew rapt. "'Tis a summons,' he said softly. "'A summons from the Queen of Fairyland!' I have waited long for it, and it hath come at last. And when he went out, instead of joining the little company of waiting men, he walked straight up to the snow-white deer. As soon as he reached it, it paused for a moment as if to greet him. Then both moved slowly down a steep bank that sloped to the little river leader, and disappeared in its foaming waters, for the stream was in full flood. And although a careful search was made, no trace of Thomas of Erkildoon was found. And to this day the country folk believe that the deer was a messenger from the elfin queen, and that he went back to fairyland with it.